find the early adopters is an obvious first step. So are you, do you disagree with that? I disagree. Um, it's not always the case. Uh, so we had early adopters in like, um, you know, enterprise and, and industry and small business. And so we had to you know, decide which one to go with. And all the advice we got was like, well, start with small business. They're the ones that are willing to, to like, you know, do as much with you and get your products off the ground. What we found was the way this industry works is if you're a small business vendor, uh, you're in that bucket. You will never deal with enterprise vendors. It's just how they're conditioned. They, they, they've been in the industry for many, many years and they've seen a lot of whimsical things. They never reached that level status of like enterprise grade. Uh, and, you know, we saw that with other companies in, in the space. They're just like, why don't they ever, you know, what's stopping them from selling enterprise and moving forward? And they always seem to be stuck in, the, in this one segment. It's not that, not even their choice. It's because they, they came out in that way. That's how the industry uh, categorizes them. Uh, so you, it's like, you know, the old saying, you, you'll never lose your job if you, if you buy an IBM or whatever, right? In, in those days. Well, that was a very similar thing in, especially when it comes to like, uh, technologies that need to be embedded in properties in buildings. Like the, the average time, um, you know, one of our hardware products sits on a door is 10 years. Uh, and <laughs> it's like, there's what products in the world sit around for, for 10 years? Even cars don't sit around that long. And, and it makes a lot of sense because they invest in its infrastructure in buildings. And they want it to work for a long time and they don't want it to be high risk because it just needs to be solid so that that way, you know, they're not spending all their time just making fundamental stuff work. They're spending their time in improving like, you know, uh, conditions and, and experiences inside of buildings. And so we learned very quickly that if we wanted to make this more broader and to make sure this is going to serve the broader market, a lot of that uh, interest that came from us, that we had to get good at both. We had to get good at like serving the small businesses, being rapid to evolve that but also developing DNA and how to make sure we can talk to enterprise customers and actually get them moving forward. And, you know, now we do more enterprise deals than small businesses. Uh, but that was a, that was against the, the flow kind of decision but that we, we recognize that in the industry. Yeah. That certainly is atypical as in not the typical process people go after. And I can't disagree with you. You've done it. It's worked for you. Uh, but how do you handle the fact that your early adopters want technology that might not be representative of what the mass market wants or the enterprise companies want? And you also might not be ready to work with an enterprise company. How, how did you do both? And did you, did you create different products for the two segments and different marketing positioning? Or is it the same core product? It's the same core product, um, just tweaked for, for, for both. And then it's just the approach on how you deal with enterprise customers. So how you spend your time and energy to make sure they can move through the process. So a typical enterprise customer will want to pilot everything and run through a pilot phase and have a checklist of things. And uh, then they want to sort of see SOC 2 compliance. They want to see all the stuff that you know, makes them feel safe and secure to, to convince their um, you know, uh, their leadership team and the rest of it to, to have a budget to spend on this. Uh, so it's, it was learning how to go through that process while it's pretty much the same product. Now, there is a difference um, you know, in, in the sense that in enterprise land, most of our deployments are working with existing systems. And that was great. We actually never wanted to do the end-to-end. -to -end, you know? We never wanted to have to build like the, the server room control system stuff. No, that was not the you know, intent for us. We only wanted to do the human representation side. How do we represent a human, use their smartphone and do that really well and make this store experience a great one, but let this store experience be reflective. Uh, this is just one use case of many now that your signal is working, um, you know, it, it literally is just getting through the door, you know, and now once you're through the door, you can use this signal in your meeting room, you can use it to log into your computer, you can use it to, um, you know, pay free coffee, all these things start to come about because now you have a relationship with that end user. And that's how we, we teed it up. And that's the common thing across enterprises and small business. We have a relationship with every single end user uh, because we're building their signal and they're just using their signal in the workplace. Uh, and that's kind of the equation that's kept us uh, in, the, in a safe zone of being able to do just the right pieces and not to try to do more than necessary. And, and we've just found that um, by not doing the end-to-end, -end, um, which a lot of startups did before and, and still do, they, they think they have to own the solution. It's my, my way or the highway. You, know, you need all my solutions because I'm trying to make maximum margin from my whole solution. And we're like, no, you don't need all of that stuff. Keep using your stuff. Just do an add-on and it's better priced. And in that way, you know, I have a relationship with the, the customer and um, the platform and technology has a relationship to the end user, pretty much your smartphone, uh, to now start representing you. And you only need one signal. You don't need like 10,000 signals. That one signal can become a routing system to query for any information and to pass it through. And, you know, we, uh, 
we, we caught on to that very quickly that uh, there was this, this common ground between all of them. Uh, and, and if we worked within that region and made sure our products are serving a need for, for those uh, regions, then we had something that was going to be mass market available um, um, in pretty short time. And now we're very much in the, in the, in the deep end of that, um, working on many multiple uh, verticals that are all come together. But they're all physical world related. They're all basically how do you interact with your physical environment and, you know, what, what Okta did for, for software into, you know, creating, you know, uh, managed identities for, for software, we're pretty much doing for the physical world. And, you know, we, we don't represent one identifier. We can represent any identifier uh, necessary for any system. Got it. So you, you touched on something very interesting. You said that your product has potentially a lifespan of 10 plus years. It makes sense. When, when I buy real estate, I'm looking at a 10-year minimum view uh, any less is is not really you know long term investment. Real estate is long term. So it sounds like that's one of the unique things about this industry we're in. If you're in prop tech and you're building a device, that device could potentially be there for years and years, if not a decade plus. No other industry is like that. Well, what else have you noticed about prop tech industry? Um, it's uh, it's an industry that that wants to move forward and now is is moving forward, but it's uh, uh, it's also it's kind of like the car business. So it's like you, you can't screw around taking risks all the time. Like you can't have cars falling apart in the middle of the highway. You can't have buildings falling apart. You can't have like just these are just like really, really has to be stable stuff. Uh, but yet uh, the innovation is there to move it forward and to really uh, you know make things more efficient and make uh, people experience buildings better. And you know that's taken time to get there. It, it's like um, um, the industry is being willing to take new risks and to try new things and to do it in a very you know controlled environment. Uh, but the industry is also looking at ways to not just be um, you know a uh, square footage vendor, right? Um, every uh, you know, and I call it like the new the new app store is the physical world. Like every building is an experience. Every way you interact with your environment is an experience. That is the new app. You know, the app is no longer inside your screen. The app is the world around you and how you interact with it and how technology works around that. And, you know, um, I actually think um, people in properties are sitting on the next big app stores. They're sitting on, hey, what experiences can we create here? What technologies can we bring in? And then what ways can we allow others to innovate through this as well? Kind of like, you know, creating a developer community to do things. And I think that's starting to happen. That's starting to, to come about. But it hasn't been... Um, easy to do because of that sort of nature of like things have to work here you know uh you know we, we can't have people locked out of their buildings like we have a running joke in our, how much money can we lose for a business well if you lock out their entire engineering team for a day <laughs> calculate the number of hours of lost productivity and it's like yeah you don't want to screw that up you know uh so so like the, there is just some fundamentals that you got to get right but at the same time the opportunity to move things forward is just tremendous it really is the this you know um uh the fertile ground where if you start to combine technologies and really think about how people are experiencing buildings and, and workplaces and the rest of it, it's, it's really time to change all that up. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a good time, I think, to, to be in, uh, in prop tech and to be really start, sort of seeing it as an opportunity to move things forward. Yeah. Totally agree. When you said that building owners literally are sitting on the next app store, what does that mean? That's a very interesting concept. Yeah, so if you think about it, um, your phone is the real estate right now. Your screen is the real estate, right? So every app developer wants to create some app where they're on your screen and you, they're doing something useful for you to, to spend time in it. Now, uh, the equivalent of that is like think of, you know, the building owner being the phone, right? They, they have the real estate. You know, you're spending time on there whether you like it or not because you work in there or, or you're basically, you know, there for, for coffee or lunch or whatever. So this real estate now becomes that environment of saying, okay, well, what applications can we run in this environment and how do we get developers to build these applications, you know, just like developers building applications on your phone. And, and when you start to see that way, Real estate really is um, uh, just the environment to innovate in. It's a box, right? Just like the smartphone is a box to innovate in. 
Um, yeah, and, and as for us, sort of, you know, I've, I've said this to a number of, you know, um, uh, building owners that like, you know, you're really sitting on the next big platform, right? You, 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 you know, if you, if you open up for like innovation to happen here and open up for like, you know, people to see how the user experience can, can evolve in these uh, environments, you know, especially once AR starts to kick in and, and, and everything else, it really becomes that that's the, the, the platform of the future. And I think we've, we've gone through the peak wave of mobile. Like we've, we've innovated the crap out of the mo mobile real estate screen <laughs> experience, you know, uh, and now the mono, the, the phone is becoming an extension of you beyond the internals of the phone. Now it's externally, right? And, and that's where we sort of, you know, are very much, you know, um, um, spending a lot of our time. It's like, okay. Uh, how do we represent you in the physical world? Use a smartphone to, to communicate around you, but see you as a symbiotic system. See you as like, you know, phone and, phone and human as one. Uh, and then the, the, the playground, the sort of the environment to innovate is everything else around you. Uh, and, you know, that's how we spend all our time, uh, innovating and building products. It's like, where can we take the user? Uh, where, where can we take the experience? And like, how is this useful for businesses? So that way, you know, we can both, you know, create new experiences and businesses can benefit from it which is like the ultimate machine that, that kind of is a recursive you know algorithm for businesses money coming in invest in more innovation and more money coming in right so like that machine is what you want to make sure you, you, you built out sure and dennis a lot of prop tech entrepreneurs are trying to figure out whether they should bootstrap and remain profitable or even attempt their profitability and slow growth versus go raise venture funding you've raised how much almost 60 million dollars in venture funding yep. Yep. so that was quite a trade up and a decision to make. Well, how, walk me through why you decided to raise that much capital versus other options you had on the table. Um, mostly because there's just so much work to do. <laughs> and like the, the biggest uh, failure here is, uh, to not to take on the challenges, right? Uh, to, to be meek on taking on the, the big challenges and, and I figured, well, if we're going to uh, uh, confront such a challenge, you know, how do you represent humans in the physical world? Uh, you need to be capitalized to do it because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to learn things, but you need to make sure you can survive through all those mistakes and survive through all those learnings so you can get to the point where uh, you have something that's sustainable and, and can move beyond you know, where it is today. And, and that's where we, we, we knew this is not going to be cheap. It's just like, you know, the Apollo program was going to be cheap, right? <laughs> Send man to the moon, bring it home safely. Not going to be cheap. We're going to have to invent science. We're going to have to invent you know, materials to, to do this, you know, and, and so that very early on that like, yeah, look, the, the vision is, is very long term. It's going to take time to get there, but just the execution of it is hard enough. You know, you, you're dealing with, um, hardware, software, like we joke around, we're pushing radio waves, we're pushing, um, bits, we're pushing, you know, electrons, we're pushing everything in, in all directions. And it all, it all has to come about to just create this one seamless experience for a new user. And, and it's, you know, crazy complex to pull it all together like that. And, uh, it's the thing that, that makes it, uh, work is, yeah, it's, 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 it takes that kind of, um, commitment to do that. So we recognized that early and we knew that the worst thing we could do is to not to wholeheartedly take on that challenge and say, well, let's make sure we're taking on this challenge and bringing on the people that can help us, uh, really do this and, and just be realistic about like, you're going to make some mistakes along the way. Some things will work. Some things won't. You, you'll learn quickly. Um, but you, it, at, at all times, you know, that there's, um, you know, we don't have to invent an industry. There, there is industries already out there. They are all looking for a better solution. Just make sure you're all the better solution, uh, and get there as soon as possible. But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it's never, it's never for the amount of, uh, of uh, money that you raise. It's always for the, you know, what do you want to achieve with this money? Uh, it's always the case for me, uh, taking on anyone's money. And maybe it's because I'm a little bit old school. For me, it's more responsibility and I, I treat it as a liability. I, I treat it as like, I've just taken X amount of money from you. I need to make sure I'm turning that money into growing this business. So that way you haven't wasted that money. I haven't wasted that money. Um, and, and I, I try to, I treat that very personal. Uh, it's like, um, it's easy, easy to spend other people's money. Uh, it's, you know, if you just treat it as like, Hey, I've only got five bucks left in my pocket. Um, do I really need that stuff? <laughs> like, do I really need that? No, you, you quickly get to like, what do you actually need to spend that five bucks on? And it goes back to my first ever startup because I was completely bootstrapped with no outside funding. Uh, and as a single founder, every dollar I made, I had to think about how I was going to use this to make my next dollar. And it was just really as simple as that. And, and this is how naive I was. I didn't, I didn't know the difference between profit and revenue. I, I just uh, thought everything was profit. It's like, 
well, how much money after spending all my expenses and everything do I have left to actually build a business with? And that's the only thing I ever measured. And when I heard others talking about their revenues and stuff, I'm like, damn, how are we pulling that off? So, so it made me, made me actually work on like building profits, you know, <laughs> uh, rather than just revenue. But it, it trained me on how to look at capital, look at very much as like, uh, it's a fuel. It's not a destination. So, um, you know, your destination is where you want to take the vehicle. So, you know, you pick where you want to move this car and you put fuel in there. But you know, uh, you're going to run out of fuel. So you're going to want to make sure this car is heading in the right direction. Uh, and you want to turn the steering wheel here and there, but you, you ultimately know that this fuel is to move things, not to just like burn up in, in its own uh, environment. So, so that's that's how I've always seen. It. And it's not to say we're going to be you know raising um, more money down down the road. Um, I mean, we're still very much early in our uh, cycle of um, uh, how we're innovating. And you know, um, prop tech is like the primary thing that that matters to us right now. Um, but very quickly, we're seeing things in transportation. We're seeing things in retail and especially now with the COVID-19 world, um, it's now, it's what we've seen happen to us is that, that all the stuff we've had on our roadmap for the future suddenly get massively crunched and say, no, need it now. <laughs> it's not because you have a choice. It's because now the, the world needs it off you. And now the, the, you know, uh, you need to be providing solutions in this new world. And, and that's the thing that's kind of like, uh, really got us, you know, um, from being, you know, working hard to working insane. To like you no know, do double the work or triple the work. COVID could easily have been uh, an event that may have forced you to retrench because you've been focusing on offices and offices are being hit hard. But you're now saying that no, there's actually opportunities in other segments and it's forcing us to go there. You've just mentioned public transport, for example, or retail. Yeah. You couldn't have done that though if you didn't have the venture funding behind you, right? Because oh, definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. So having and venture funding was an advantage, a strategic advantage, yeah. and, and that was intentional. Um, it, it was you know part of the going into the funding ground is like, look, you know, we've got a beachhead here. We've got a very clear vertical we're going after, but you know, we're building an identity platform for the physical world, right? Yeah. First, you're either on that journey or you're not. If you're, if you're not on that journey, then you're going to, you're not, you're going to have a hard time. Right. And so like, you know, selecting the right investors that are part of the journey is one thing. Uh, and then saying, look, this is one beachhead, but ultimately here is the data sets of what we have already coming to us. All, all, all going back to that original website where we had those pilots. We, we had the data sets even back then saying like, you know, this is not something that we're wishful of. This is getting pulled from us. Uh, the only thing is we're not doing it right now. We're not dedicating any time with that. But we know that there's multiple uh, paths to this thing. And, and, you know, it's like, you know, which one of these things are going to end up taking us to the vision sooner rather than later. We don't know which one's going to be more efficient or all the rest of it. But we want to stay flexible along the way. Uh, and so we're going to raise a little bit more capital, make sure we have that flexibility. Uh, and that's with the, you know, long-term partners that, that are with us all the way through. And they're willing to say, look, you know, this beachhead might, might not work, but you know, if you need to flip and jump into that beachhead, go do it. Don't waste any time. Don't hesitate for a second. Cause we're all focusing on like, you know, can you take this to where it needs to get to? Uh, and you know, don't, you don't get a lot of luxury there. That's, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, typical is mostly just about survival. It's mostly just like, like, can I just survive the next day? Um, but we, we very much like, um, have been close to not surviving many times, but at the same time, um, we, we always have a way to keep figuring out what it takes to get going, what it takes to like, um, let's save money not doing that piece. Let's focus on doing that piece. Let's quickly convince ourselves whether it's working or not. So that way, you know, we're working on the pieces that's actually moving us forward. Uh, and, you know, that's just the discipline you have to have because no matter how much money you're raising and, and I can say when, um, uh, when we got that first check from YC going back way back in the day, that was a fifteen thousand dollar check. Fifteen thousand <laughs> from Y Combinator. Thousand from Y Combinator. Back in the days where it used to be based on how many founders were in the team and how much ramen noodle you can eat in three months, right? That was the calculation of how much to fund you. <laughs> you know, uh, but that was like I. It, uh, it was so clear in, in my head. That's all we needed in those three months to survive. Right. Uh, and it gave us all the flexibility to say, okay, well, if we can prove out this, this, and this in this three months, then yes, we can bring in more capital, but at least that capital knows what it's going to be doing. It's going to be helping us move this from this area to that area. Uh, so it's not just for the sake of raising capital. And I've always had that since that, that moment of ever receiving my first check. Uh, to even, you know, our recent rounds. So it's like, okay, it's not just about this size of the fund. It's about like, what are we doing with this to move this forward to increasing our, our probability of succeeding in moving it forward. And, and it, it, it's never, never for a second you think like, you know, uh, don't screw it up. Um, you know, don't, uh, 
Um, don't do something foolish enough where, you know, you're doing whimsical stuff, like trying to be as disciplined as possible, but also be aggressive in terms of like wanting to achieve also be sometimes unrealistic because you just don't know what the limits are. You don't know what's possible or not until you push it You to really, really sort of, you know, push the fundamentals. Uh, and, and so you need to have room to do that. And, and, you know, I try to balance that with like part of our journey of, um, have enough capital, but have flexibility, but really, uh, drive for insights and understanding of how well this could work, how, how your business working and how you can move it forward. And, and that's probably never going to end. That's probably going to be like, you know, a continuous, uh, process, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's no luxury to have capital. It's a uh, luxury to have options, I would say. Uh, right. but it's what you do with those options and, and it's what you do with the capital that makes all the difference. And I've seen plenty of startups that have raised a lot less to do a lot more. Right. And, and that's the thing that you want to balance.